I, I'll start, I guess, by introducing myself and talking a little bit about my background. Um, so uh, this project is a that I'm mostly going to be talking about today is not actually uh, kind of my main thesis project. Um, what I mainly work on now is with Jim Demo, um, who is uh, an numerical analyst and a high-performance computing person in Berkeley. And so I developed parallel numerical linear algebra algorithms, um, and we've done everything from basis multiply, and now we're working towards this method I can solve, which will probably be the core of my thesis. Uh, but so this project, which uh, I spent a lot of time on and split about half my time with, uh, started at Argon uh, when I did a uh, practicum with Jeff Hammond. So uh, actually, so I'm supported by a Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship, as is Devin, uh, one of our, uh, my collaborators, and as was Jeff. And so that's how we all met and got together back at Argonne uh, and started this project. Um, my background is in computer science. Uh, I got my undergrad in that uh, at the University of Illinois, um, while both Jeff and Devin are computational chemists in some quantum chemistry. Um, Devin works with John Stanton, um, and so uh, he's been providing a lot of the uh, uh, chemistry uh, contributions to this project while I've been doing essentially the plus attraction uh, part of everything. So everything involving sensors, I basically implemented, and Jeff has been super supervising the project. Okay, um, so that's enough about me. Uh, this is not working. Um, is that thing not working? Okay, that's okay, so to outline, I'm going to start uh, a little talking about communication of learning algorithms. So this is this ties into my work in Merkel uh, linear algebra too. So uh, since the group that I'm talking to is has a lot of chemistry folks and not computer scientists, I want to talk a little bit about uh, communication um, instead of computation and how we kind of approach algorithms. So it's going to start pretty basic. Uh, then I'll talk about basic multiplication and some of the algorithms and kind of uh, lower bounds of communication that we have on for that because matrix multiplication is essentially the building block for tensor contractions. Uh, tensor contractions are going to reduce the matrix multiplications, so it's going to get interesting because of the symmetries. Um, so to kind of say anything about computationally about tensor contractions, matrix multiplication is required background. Um, so after introducing all of that, I will uh, go into a couple cluster, uh, do a small review of the formalism, which will probably be embarrassing in my part with respect to how much you guys know, um, but I'll do that anyway. And then I'll talk about NWTM and talk about the library that we've designed and our CCSD implementation on top of that. Um, and then I'll show some results. Okay. Uh, so communication is expensive and is the bottleneck now in a single machine, in a parallel you know, node, we, we can have threads. So you, all your computers now have some number of cores. Um, and most computations in HPC or outside of it aren't bound by the clock rate of your machine, but by the bandwidth and by the latency. So, and this involves memory movement between levels of cache, between DRAM and cache, um, and between nodes, between cores. Um, and so, I'm interested in HPC in particular, so I study large high-performance computing systems with many, many nodes uh, over high-performance interconnects uh, or over infinity band, and there, that communication uh, can be the main bottleneck, though the on node communication is also plays its toll. But the biggest problem is essentially that time per clock keeps improving, we can, before it was Moore's Law and you know, everything was kind of improving. Now we're adding more and more cores and via parallelism, the clock rate keeps improving just because there's more computing units. Uh, but the bandwidth the latency are, do not keep up at all. So this just shows that the annual improvements lag heavily behind that. And I got this from my advisor, his talks. He always starts with this. Essentially, our groups, what our group is doing, the algorithms in the Merkle linear algebra, is redesigning them so as not to necessarily minimize computation, but to minimize communication, which is not something really hasn't been the main focus of algorithm designers throughout the past decades. Um, but so communication also takes more energy, and this is a projection to you know some technology in 2018, I think that John Schaaf did, uh, John Schaaf did from OVO, and essentially shows that, okay, so flops are going to cost a lot less energy, uh, and communication isn't. So these red bars are what's going to happen uh, in 2018, and maybe they go down by some small factor, but this fact, they don't keep up with this factor of time that flops are going to go down by. So essentially flops are becoming free while communication is becoming all the costs. So when I'm doing the analysis here, I'll be focusing on the communication costs of everything uh, rather than the computation costs. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, well, continuing with that, I guess. Uh, well, I'm going to introduce something we call lower bound for communication or algorithms. So um, and are you guys familiar with asymptotic notation? 
the sign is red, so everybody knows that. So this is the same thing except a lower bound. So when we usually upper bound the cost, we say it's no more than this. This tells us asymptotically no less than this. So for some algorithm like basic multiplication, what we can say is that it costs at least this much no matter what you do. Um, and so this is a proof technique that essentially validates our algorithm. So we can compare the upper bound that the algorithm achieves to the lower bound that is constituted by proof. Um, and so this kind of proof is kind of the center of the research that we're doing in our linear algebra as well as at the sunset contractions and their parallelization. And essentially saying that, okay, let's think of any subset of entries that we might compute in this multiplication. So in this multiplication, you can think of as having three indices and being a 3D, a 3D graph, a 3D cuboid, with each phase corresponding to A, B, and C, three matrices, the three inputs. Um, and so what do you do when you're parallelizing that or scheduling that? You take some subset of those entries and you compute it um, within some sequential period of time on one machine. So you can have m many machines taking different subsets at the same time, or one machine pulling out blocks and trying to do it in a way that moves it at the least amount of data. So there's a mathematical theorem that becomes useful here if you want to talk about the communication required to, look at, to do this computation. So it basically says that no matter what kind of subsets I take out of those cuboids, what computations I do, how I schedule it, I can't do any better than doing a cube of computation. So this kind of face of the cube, uh, so up to the three halves is the volume of the cube, uh, and omega m is the uh, one of the faces of the cube. So no matter what I do, I can't kind of beat uh, this projection. And so this corresponds to, you know, some amount of data that I need to compute a chunk of that uh, misimplification. So if I'm just scheduling data in chunks um, with some more proof techniques, we can show, we can essentially derive an upper bound. So G is kind of the size of the cuboid, so it's going to be n cubed if it's n by n multiplication. It's G over the square root of m uh, for the bandwidth uh, cost, where, which is the number of words that we need to move to do just the computation sequentially. Um, and S is the latency cost. And this is just uh, divided by m, since each message can be at most your size, um, which m is your chunk size, or you can think of it as your local memory. So you, know, you can think of you know th these matrices as being somewhere global memory, and you're pulling out some chunks of size m and doing some part of computation with that. And we're saying that you can do no more than m to the 3 halves computation with a chunk. Well, for one matrix, right? Or m with respect to all memory. You have the pieces of all three matrices. All memory over the three pieces. Yeah, yeah. So since it's asymptotic, it's a factor of three. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't really matter. But what, what, what happens is that you can, uh, you can try to pull out different chunks, but you still have three projections on the basis of the matrices. Mm -hmm. So you need to get some data from each matrix, and the best you can do is have a subcube that you compute. So if you compute in cubes at a time, that's kind of optimal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we try to do. And it turns out with tons series, you want to do the same thing, because you want to pull out cubes, even though you think they're higher dimensional, they reduce the same thing, because there's still three projections. But I'll get to that. Um, OK, so this is, has been known for a while um, and extended further. So as it turns out, you can essentially use this lower bound technique for most numerical linear algebra. So Cholesky, LU, the Eigensoft, QR, all of that fits in this category, and you can derive this lower bound, um, which really gives a nice starting point for developing linear algebra algorithms. Okay, so if you just plug in on here, it's going to be m cubed over root m, it's just a number of computations, and this is kind of the factor that we get out of pulling out the chunks. Um, and the same argument holds essentially for a parallel execution. So if I have p processors, I'm just dividing by p. Um, you know, this is the matrix multiplication. There's no dependencies anyway, so it's trivial to parallelize. So everybody just pulls out different chunks. Um, okay. So uh, moving on from that, uh, kind of, what, uh, there's a bunch of ways to implement parallel matrix multiplication, and the standard one actually doesn't really reach the slower bound that I just introduced. So 2D algorithms, which are Canon's algorithm and Summa. Which I won't actually go into the algorithms of this talk because the algorithm is necessary. Uh, but essentially, what they do is they block the matrices and move around the data, but they don't replicate the data. So they're essentially blocking the faces. Um, and they're not blocking the computational graph, this G. They're not pulling out cubes, they're pulling out subblocks. And because they don't use essentially more memory than necessary, they're just keeping one copy of the matrices, they achieve a smaller, uh, they do more communication. Um, there's also 3D algorithms which says, okay, pick the cubes uh, and give each processor a cube to compute, and that's essentially the whole algorithm. Every processor computes a cube, and then there's a reduction back to one phase to C, uh, and, that, and then you compute your answer. Um, the problem with that is it requires a lot more memory, 
um, you need to essentially use the one third more memory to store all these copies. Because what you're doing is you're essentially replicating. You're using the same faces on multiple processors. Um, so one thing we've done is we've kind of adapted this and wrote two more general algorithms that uh, do the right thing for any amount of memory between that go between these, and that's what we call them 2.5. Um, because 3D means 3D blocking, 2D means 2D blocking, and 2.5 means we're doing something in the middle. Um, and so, so for me, multiplication is pretty trivial, but we've extended this to uh, basically a lot of the rest of linear algebra, which has been very non-trivial. Um, and we can also do the same technique for tensors. But the point is that the approach we want to take is one that minimizes communication, and that's what we're mostly paying attention to. Okay. So um, to define tensor contractions, uh, I guess a ton of indices may be more necessary. Um, so for arbitrary dimensional tensors, uh, reals, uh, we have uh, a contraction over some subset of the indices. So here it's, we're summing over the J's indices. And we're just sort of just things of this form for the purpose of this talk. I'm not doing anything else with tensors. Um, so I'm going to introduce some notation for folding because I haven't, uh, I've looked at some reviews for, I guess, tensor notation. And the notation that describes taking a couple of indices and treating them as one. So I can have an iterator that goes over multiple indices at once. I essentially linearize indices or fold them. And there's appears to be no good notation in, that I could find for it. So I'm labeling it with these uh, square brackets around the indices that are folded into one. So what I'm saying here is that if you look at the sensor contraction where we contract over these indices, uh, over the J indices, uh, we can put brackets around those and treat them as one index. And all of a sudden, here's two indices, two indices on each uh, tensor, and really we just have a multiplication. So we just iterate over all of these indices and we're done. Okay, so now tensor contractions sound really easy. All you do is this. In the worst case, you, you need to transpose these indices. So if your data is in a format where, you know, one of these J's happens to be in the middle of these I's, so this is in what order they're increasing, you need to transpose it so that all the J's are lower and all the I's are higher. Um, but this is all you need to do for non-symmetric tensors. So it's pretty trivial. Um, and so, so okay, you do that, and it turns out you can use the same argument. You can use three projections on A, B, and C here, except the projections are now lower subset of indices, but you have the same exact lower bound and misdivocations and negation optimal in this case. Um, okay, but so what if you have symmetry? Uh, and this is where it gets interesting. So for instance, let's say I'm again introducing more nasty notation. Uh, so parentheses now over indices are going to denote a symmetric group. So that means that any permutation of the indices within the parentheses gives the same value. So here, if I permute IG, I get the same value, or I can have skew symmetry. If I permute it, I get the negation of the value. Um, for computational purposes, I don't really care if I have skew symmetry or if I have symmetry. What I care about is the fact that I only want to store half the indices if I have two next permutational symmetry, because half the data is redundant. Uh, so I'll be denoting both of these as parentheses. Uh, and I'm also going to be ignoring essentially what happens to the diagonal. So if you have a matrix that's skew symmetric, the diagonal is zero. Uh, if you have a matrix that's just symmetric, the diagonal can be something. Um, but so that's not something you have to worry about to practice, but it's a kind of a lower cost and kind of bothersome to keep up with the notation. So I'll kind of ignore that. Okay, but so now let's actually look at higher order tensor contractions with a bunch of partial symmetries. So even here, the whole, not the whole tensor is symmetric, but only a portion of the indices are symmetric. So I can have either case. Um, the partial symmetries are getting more interesting now because a couple cluster tensors have partial symmetries um, within our indices. Um, and I'll get through that. Uh, but okay, so essentially what happens is in a contraction, kind of two things can happen to symmetries. They can be preserved within a contraction. And what, what I mean by preserved, uh, so if we think about the kind of computational graph and the indices of that graph, so we can think of, so this is a 4D tensor times a 5D tensor contracted over three indices. Um, so this should be, uh, uh, I, I, be, I believe the computational graph is a 7D tensor. Um, and I'm questioning that maybe. Uh, okay, but uh, no, yeah, 7D, that's right. Because two indices are shared plus three. So in mission multiplication, for example, we had a 3D, uh, we could think of the computational graph as something that's 3D, a 3D cuboid or a 3D tensor of some values. So here is a 7D tensor because this is just how we specified it. And so I can denote entries there as a triplet of the corresponding entries of C, A, and B. The C is going to be the output entry, and A and B are the two operands. <coughs> and why I'm doing this is because I want to look at what permutation of indices in G 
is going to preserve all the symmetries of all these tensors, not just one. Um, and so if I permute the I and J indices, then C and A get permuted, and I still have the same triplet. Still, I still have the same value. So in my computational graph, that means I've preserved uh, the symmetry IJ. But if I permute, for instance, uh, with, for example, with the broken symmetry, um, uh, I permuted L and R, which we had B to B being symmetric in L and R. And so now if I permute that in a whole graph, I turns out a break of symmetry because uh, the C value associated with this, the C output is a different one. So the triplet value here changes. Um, so this is kind of the two things that can happen. And so the, what I've actually done here is all the preserved symmetries, which are just P and Q and I and J. And so clearly here there was a bunch of other symmetries that we lost. Um, and so, okay, so and computationally these two symmetries are going to be completely ends of the spectrum in terms of how we handle them. Uh, this is why I kind of uh, subdivided them. So if the symmetries are preserved, that's great. Um, then we can just fold them and we're done. Essentially, we can say, okay, iterate just over I less than J if I and J are preserved in this little contraction um, and fold that into one index in pack format. So if I'm just storing the lower triangle of a matrix, I'm saying just treat the lower triangle as one index. And both my two tensors are going to have this lower triangle, so I can just iterate over the lower triangle as if it was one index. And so I don't even need to deal with the explicit effect of the lower triangle, which computationally is really nice. Now all of a sudden I have something linear. Uh, a nice non-symmetric index instead of two symmetric indices. Um, so that's great. And so I'm saving flops and I'm saving memory and I needed to know extra work. I just have some refactor to the fact that I'm not uh, doing the other part of the symmetric contraction. Um, but so this is th th this is perfect and we want to exploit this whenever we see it. So whenever we have a preserved symmetry, we never un we never want to unpack the tensors. We always want to stay in that format. We always want to fold that index and just but then we can run DJump. So I can just run DJump just mean simplification. So I can just do this with me to the So that works great. So what, what happens with broken symmetries? So with broken symmetries is something that, you, I, that can actually happen in matrix multiplication. So in matrix multiplication, there's no way I could have the two matrices be symmetric and end up with something symmetric. Um, because kind of every index is either contracted or shared by two different things. So all the symmetries die within matrix multiplication. But I can have a broken symmetry. So if both A and B were symmetric, uh, my output C will be not symmetric. Um, and so in that case, what can I do? I can unpack A and B, which just means store the whole thing and just run one matrix multiplication over and treat it as non symmetric. But then I'm using more memory than I ought to be. So what I can do instead is I can do kind of three or four different matrix multiplications, which involve permutations of these indices. And essentially, each one of these is just uh, one permutation of uh, KI and IL in A and B. And, but so the way I you do it is that you only iterate over the lower triangular portion. So only for I less than K, I less than O, or whichever one. So you only ever touch um, the lower triangular portion. So we can stay in symmetric format and do essentially more contractions um, when the symmetry is broken to compute the answer. But we're doing, as it turns out, the same number of comput flops, computations when we do this as we do in the non-symmetric format. Essentially, all of these take a quarter of the flops of the total one. So we're iterating over half the space here and half the space here. Um, but we want to do this, uh, especially, for example, in couple cluster, uh, because we want to stay in permutational symmetric format, especially when our amplitudes can have main dimensional symmetry, where this is smaller by d factorial over d is the symmetry. Uh, so and I'll, I'll get to that, too. Um, OK. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I should comment a bit more on that. So you know, why, why do we care about saving this small amount of memory? Um, because it's, it, it can be huge. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it, it looks like it, for matrices, there's a factor of two. So like in our in the numerical linear algebra, like we don't really care too much if it's symmetric. We can just store the whole thing, you know, store the triangle in parallel algorithms to do that. It's, it's, it's a small factor, and it's broken, so you don't save much. Um, but for tensor contractions, you could have, for instance, you know, if I'm doing TCSDT, uh, my I can have you know my amplitude tensors have six indices, and uh, they can have a uh, partial symmetries among the two two index groups involving three indices. Uh, and each one of those is a factor of six. It's three times two. And it's generally for a d-dimensional symmetry group, it's d-factorial, uh, which you need to store. It's every permutation, so you get a factorial. But so it's six squared, so it's a factor of 36, that's the number that you use. And so for CCTQ, it's huge. Um, but even for CCTQ, 
CCSD, it already matters. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go to actually how we do contractions, and I'm going to start with a description of how in WKM does contractions. And so the way uh, Jeff described in WKM to me uh, when I get started at Argon was okay. So it has it uses global arrays, which somehow stores the data somewhere within some blocks, uh, and then it has for each contraction just a bunch of for loops, uh, and then the for loops have load balancing that that says that essentially okay, uh, iterate over all the blocks and all the space of the contraction in the you know we had a 7D space, we have a 3D space, whatever it is, uh, pull each block locally, and so this is done with one-sided communication, which is kind of a faster way to communicate point-to-point uh, -point in a non-blocking fashion within global arrays. So, okay, pull the two blocks, check if they have symmetries, because this is a block, they could have symmetries, it could be it could just be zero, I think. I don't know exactly how that's handled, but I think this it, literally checks if it's zero, if it is, move on. Uh, and so, you just pull all these blocks, uh, by each, from each process, check what they are, do the proper transpose on the block, and then call the jump, call mission communication. So that's kind of the high-level approach. Uh, the kind of the, and, and it's actually good because it's iterating through the entire graph, so it actually uh, theoretically does the minimal amount of communication. But it has a couple of disadvantages. First of all, for every block, it's doing the transpose. So since you're pulling the same block many times to do different block subcontractions, you're transposing the block many times. Um, second of all, uh, this isn't load balance. Every process is pull, just pulling some subset of the blocks and doing different work based on the blocks. So different processes do different amounts of work. So in WCAM uses dynamic load balance to fix this. Um, but this is, turns out to be a, somewhat of a scaling problem. Um, so what we're gonna try, what kind of our approach does is it tries to have a much more regular decomposition to this. Uh, and avoid this load and balance while still having optimal communication. And better yet, we want to do the communication in a way that's not just pull this block from whatever it is. We actually want to micromanage it essentially and do it in nice collective fashion um, so that everything's scheduled in a nice load balance fashion. Okay, and then we want to essentially employ the algorithm the optimizations that we have for linear algebra. Um, so did I miss anything about NWKIM? Uh, I think not really. Okay. So Cyclops Tensor Framework, and I'll explain the name Cyclops uh, later. Uh, what, what we do is well, probably more complicated. Uh, but so essentially, we're going to this is just a high level overview, and I'll go into details in a lot of these stuff uh, in the coming slides. But so the tensor layout uh, and how the tensor is decomposed among processors is constantly changing based on the contraction. So we kind of do a transpose on the global tensor. And then we do the contraction, as opposed to you know pulling out blocks and transposing them. We transpose the whole thing, and then we iterate and do the global algorithm. Um, a big thing that we do is we decompose everything cyclically. I'll explain what that means. Essentially, what we get is something that preserves symmetric pack structure on each process. So every block that's stored is actually a packed uh, tensor, rather than you know a block can be square or triangular or in higher dimensions that explodes the different permutations. Uh, so I'll explain how that works. Uh, and so, again, we transpose. So before each contraction, we redistribute. Um, if we do do unpacking for the broken indices if there's enough memory, because keeping up with broken symmetries is essentially harder. And if you can unpack, then you should just do it. Um, That's what we found. Uh, and then we can everything becomes nicer. But for some tensors, we don't have enough memory because they're the bottleneck, and we don't unpack those. Um, so just two different kind of approaches. That, and, we, and we kind of decide this dynamically based on the available amount of memory. Um, OK, and so how we do contractions locally is uh, we take the preserved symmetries and the non-symmetric indices and transpose them to be the quickest increasing indices with the tensor. Um, so uh, it acts as like the leading dimension of the tensor, or the matrix usually called the one that's corresponds to the index that increases when you move the pointer by one, right? So we want to take all the non-symmetric indices, all the non-symmetric dimensions, uh, uh, as well as the preserved symmetric, symmetric ones, which we can just fold into non-symmetric ones, and make them the leading dimensions. Because what we're going to do later is iterate over the top dimensions, which are broken, which we can use kind of a dumb code for and actually check for all the symmetries, and then call me solidification on the lower section of the indices. Um, and so that way, we can amortize the cost over 
more complex iteration scheme um, by calling uh, a blas mixed lubrication is really fast for each one and spending time on each one. Uh, okay. And so, and to actually move around data uh, while we do the global contraction, we essentially must mixed lubrication algorithms along the metrics. But okay, I'll now go through all of that kind of again in more detail. Okay, so what's a cyclic decomposition? Um, cyclic means that we essentially, instead of taking, giving somebody a contiguous block of things, we give them every so many things. So instead of, if I have four processors and I have a vector, I can give each process a quarter of the vector, each contiguous portion, or I can give each process every fourth element with phase four with some offset. And so what it turns out is I want to is we do the cyclic decomposition, as opposed to what NWE Chem does, which it uses blocks. Um, and so this turns out to be really important. I'll just give the diagram. Because, so, okay, let's say we have this lower triangular tensor. So the original thing is just the green part. This one was stored. And the red part is redundant. So this is the symmetric part. So if I used a block layout, uh, so each one of these is a block. Some of the blocks are red because they're, they're either zero or they're padding or something like that. Um, or they're unpacked. Uh, I can use a block cyclic layout, which is kind of a combination of cyclic and blocked, and it's a bit better. But if I use a cyclic layout, all the blocks here have the same structure as the original green stuff did. So all of these are packed uh, tensors. So this just looks like a small one of the big green thing. Um, and that's because essentially, by keeping the same cyclic phase, uh, you reach uh, the symmetric portion at the same rate. So, but it's not quite true because the top uh, top right quadrant of the processor grid, in this case, well, actually, I guess the whole um, top right half uh, is going to get some of this stuff. So essentially, uh, you, you get a super diagonal um, because you're some phase off from the zero phase. So if, if my phase is something like uh, one zero, so I'm one down, uh, in the first row of processors, in the first column of processors, uh, I'm going to be below the diagonal in each one of these sub subtrends that I take. But if my face is zero one, then I'm kind of taking this guy, then this guy, then this guy, then this guy. Well, some of that, 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 something in this guy, then this guy, then this guy, then this guy. But I still get that one diagonal less than the guy who got an element there. So there's like this little bit of padding that we have to do, which corresponds in this case to the diagonal. In the general case, the surface area of the tensor, at least the internal one corresponding to the padding there. So there is some overhead that we have to pay, but it's less. And the big thing that we get is that each subtensor that we pull out just has the same pack structure. So this is kind of the big decomposition that um, kind of drives the entire idea, because this, is, this might seem a bit trivial, uh, but it gives a huge difference in terms of how we can then uh, write the code, because this is an abstraction. Because now every subtensor has the same structure as the global tensor. So if I had a sequential code for contracting this global symmetric tensor, um, and I want to now parallel it, okay, well, so I do this decomposition, and for each of the subtensor contractions, which is going to involve one of these blocks and another one of these blocks somewhere else in the other tensor, I can just call it for a smaller size. So my block contractions just look the same as the global contraction. Um, and so now, for, for instance, I, the first thing I did, my task was to write the parallel code. I'm an expert on parallelization. So I wrote this code with the hope that somebody else would write me a sequential kernel. Uh, and I could literally take a pointer to uh, a function pointer to a sequential kernel and then call it. And that was the interface. Um, and so I, I just wrote a dumb sequential kernel that was slow. Uh, but then nobody wrote uh, a sequential kernel, so I wrote one, which involves this non packing and folding, which works pretty well. But it's not necessarily the best thing you can do. But um, if I understand you correctly, in order to achieve that, say that you reorganize the tensor every time before right. the contraction of all tensors in the right? So you actually can use data and distribute it in terms of storage, right? Isn't that uh, kind of large workload both in terms of operations beyond communication because you have to move several around? Right. Uh, so uh, it is a large overhead and it's that's kind of the, the, the main but uh, in framework in terms of the overhead that we pay mm -hmm. is doing these redistributions. Um, and they weren't overhead, especially with initial implementations. Um, then I optimized it. Um, I, there's essentially a redistribution kernel that uh, is linear time, respect to how it touches everything, uh, and it's threaded, so it's fast locally, because actually the energy drop costs a lot. 
And I'll get get to explain more why, why those things are really, really nasty. Um, and so there is kind of so much overhead we have to pay for doing this transpose and essentially bucketing everything. Mm -hmm. And there's also communication overhead, which is an all to all view, which is everybody communicating with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those, uh, both of those are kind of theoretically on low order, and in practice they're low order most of the time. Uh, and they're not they're not low order as in they're zero in practice. They're low order as in they're less. Uh, for instance, I'll show results where we spend less time in that than in Um And further, they scale. So as we increase number of processors, these kernels don't kind of explode in the amount of time they take. Um, so from that point of view, it's okay. Um, but yeah, this is this is the big overhead of this approach. Is the fact that need to redistribute uh, before every contraction. Um, and I'll explain why it's actually nastier even than just what this looks like. Okay. Uh, so sequential test contractions, which I touched on earlier. Um, so if there's enough memory on back, uh, then we perform this essentially non-symmetric transpose. So we need to do another transpose essentially here, uh, even during sequential execution. Uh, but this transpose is cheaper. Uh, because first of all, it happens only locally. You just take your packed portion of the tensor and you reorder the indices. Second of all, it's fully non-symmetric. So I can treat all the, since I'm, I'm not treating broken symmetries here, so I'm treating symmetric groups as either one index uh, or I'm, uh, yeah, so I'm always treating symmetric groups as one index. Um, so the logic is a lot nicer, uh, though I, I found that actually during sequential execution for when the tensors are kind of near square, so I guess when the number of uh, occupied orbitals and the number of electrons is small compared to the number of virtual orbitals, all the contractions look like almost sums. Um, then this becomes somewhat of a bottleneck. But that's only sequentially. And when, I, when this code runs in parallel, because it's only kind of doing a portion uh, of the global tensor, which is rather small, this, this, this kernel costs very little. Um, but it does cost something. Uh, and so after that, we iterate to do each subcontraction or each sequential contraction through the broken symmetry indices on top. We call it gem for each one of those. Um, so you can think of it as two nested iterators one that's actually dealing with symmetry, one that's not, one where everything's folded in this. Um, okay, uh, so more issues with the cyclic layout, uh, or I guess, I mean, there's certainly many advantages, but there's also some issues. So for what we need to do in terms of decomposition is, is pretty complicated. Uh, because so we have a bunch of symmetric dimensions and we want to preserve the structure. Uh, but so I want to handle this in an arbitrary way. So the way the code is written doesn't assume anything about the partial symmetries, doesn't assume anything about the tensor dimension. Um, so this is supposed to work for arbitrary order couple of cluster, which my collaborators really want to do. They want to do CCTQ and they have all flavors of tensors. So they just want to work for everything. Um, so that's what we implement. But to do that, okay, what do we need to maintain? We need for every symmetric group, every index within that group has to have the same symmetric phase. Um, that means it has to be decomposed with the same phase or this is a waste of time or it's not preserving the back structure. Um, so we need to maintain that. Uh, so they can track the dimensions of A and B. So the way I map A and B, my operands, must match in some fashion. It's rather complex, actually. Um, and and for, But definitely, every dimension that are shared, so if, if, two, if two tensors share an index with a contraction, then index better have the same phase, or I'm logically going to be doing nonsense. Um, and so with all of that, I still need to map this somehow to the physical uh, machine. So the physical machines have some number of processors, and I want the decomposition to be a certain thing based on the phase. So, for instance, if I'm given, let's skip to this, a uh, two by three processor grid, how do I, and I have, you know, two, let's say A and B are, and I'm contracting A and B with the same cyclic phase, I don't have to deal with symmetry here, I guess. Um, what I need is for this contracted dimension to be as long as this one. Um, and that's already non trivial because I have this two by three thing. Um, so, what you do is you, is you can, Essentially, we do virtualization. So we say um, decompose with the larger phase than the actual physical processor dimension. So we assume we always have a some kind of toroidal processor grid, uh, and then we virtualize within that processor grid to stretch the dimensions to something that we want. Uh, so it's there's that complexity. Here. So what did I skip? Um, right. So virtual processor grid dimensions. Um, and so this is the extra complexity that we have. So now we have essentially locally we store a bunch of blocks. Um, in each block corresponds to a virtual process. Mm -hmm. So uh, we actually over-decompose the tensor. Um, over-decomposition is not 
new in uh, parallel computing, um, Trump Plus Plus, which is a parallel framework for computations that actually uh, is the main project that I worked on back when I was at Illinois. The whole idea there is to always already compose rather than to assign the processors to assign the virtual processors and from the computation in that fashion. Um, and so what this is doing is more to the wire in terms of there's a number of blocks that we keep and there's a virtualization that's constantly changing for every contraction. Um, so the number of virtual blocks can change from contraction to contraction and the page changes from contraction to contraction. And furthermore, the padding changes for each tensor from contraction to contraction. So everything changes. Uh, so it's it's complex to retrieve, uh, but it can be done and we would do it quickly enough. Okay, uh, right. So and so what we yeah I guess before that what we we'll further do is when we pick the layout for every contraction, we pick one that has the least amount of virtualization, and we tune over all of them. And we also consider essentially a performance model of things as to what uh, decomposition is best before doing every contraction. Uh, but typically, when we when I'm, when I'm actually running CCSD, um, okay, so some, some of the tensors, especially in the, in the, in the important contractions, have like a factor of two, factor of four virtualization, which isn't bad. If the virtualization was large, it would be terrible. Um, and so, but because of that, we have to support higher dimensional processor grids. But actually, I'll get to all of that I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, but so a diagram for uh, mapping a 3D tensor now with symmetries. Um, so this is a 3D tensor contracted with a 2D tensor into a 3D tensor, something that you will never see in CCSD, but I can't draw CCSD contractions because they're four-dimensional. Uh, so this is what we get. Also, drawing this symmetric packed portion of a 3D tensor is surprisingly difficult. Uh, I, I did it wrong a lot of times. This is a fully symmetric 3D tensor. Uh, and so, okay, you think, okay, it's supposed to be one six. So you take kind of the sixth corner, right? You, just, yeah, you did it around the corner, but that's not really right. Uh, it's got to be. It's got to go like that. It's not. It's not perpendicular here. It's. It can't have a perpendicular angle. So there's like a way to do it wrong and a weird way to do it right. Uh, but so I think this is the right way. I hope at least I've done it wrong before. Uh, but so okay. So we had one whole of these and we decomposed into blocks like that. I'm not drawing blocks inside because then you can see anything. Uh, and so we're contracting it with a 2D symmetric guy into a 3D guy with where a pair of these are symmetric. Um, and we want to do this on a 2 by 4 process grid because we have eight processors. So what we might do is decompose it in a way such that um, every guy gets eight blocks of this 3D tensor, two blocks of this tensor, uh, and eight blocks of the output tensor. Um, and so when we do this, we, are, we, we have the same cyclic phase in all the dimensions that are symmetric for each tensor. So we preserve those structures. Um, but this is how a schedule might work. Um, okay, um, so back to processor grids, how do we deal with that? Okay, well, so um, part of the motivation here is, so I, I was doing this work at Argon, and my background has been in, in HPC, and I'm working with very large clusters and supercomputers. Uh, and one of the first machines that I worked on was a Fujian P, which is a 3D torus. And uh, some of the research we were doing there within HPC was essentially showing that the topology of the thing really matters. So if you do, if you take your application and you map it in a way to the computer network that makes sense to actually use the 3D torus, your application will go a lot faster. Um, and while I was at Argon, was about a year away from Blue Q coming up, which is a 5D torus. So I thought a cool project would be to take you know high dimensional tensors and map them to high dimensional network. Uh, turned out to be a lot harder than uh, well, it's not hard in the first place, but okay. Uh, the point is that we now, having this kind of flexible decomposition, we can map to physical topology. So on the blue gene queue that I now have results on, uh, we actually map the physical topology of the 5D network, and we take into account um, any possible prediction that we might get, which we only find out about until runtime. Um, but so this is only useful on a few machines, though, though even those few machines can allow us to do really large calculations and scale really well, so it's still important from an HPC point of view. Uh, but if we don't have that, if we just have a cluster or we have an, you know, any topology that's not nice, which is the typical case when you're running a, any kind of machine uh, that's parallel, uh, what we do is we just take the processor count, we factorize it, and what we factorize it up to some number of factors typically because it doesn't make sense. So let's say I get up to eight factors for the processor grid and I try to make them as close to each other as possible, and then I start folding. And in fact, 
So on on in on Blue Team I would get five factors. Um, and generally, yeah, if I get some other prediction, I take eight factors. And then I start folding the adjacent dimensions and form up all the other processor grids that are lower dimensional uh, foldings of the high dimensional processor grid. And I want to do that because depending on what my tensors are, if they're 3D or if they're 4D, I want to map to a 4D network or a 3D network or a different topology. Uh, and so I want to take into account all these possible nice kind of topologies that are available uh, based on different foldings. Uh, when I do these foldings, I'm still make, doing a nice modular mapping on Blue Gene Q because now I'm using multiple dimensions instead of one, and that works fine too. So we essentially take this base processor grid, fold it in all possible ways, and then try mapping to all of them. Uh, and when we say try mapping, it doesn't mean we distribute the data to uh, the mapping, but just say, okay, well, count what dimensions the tensor would have and what padding I would need and what communication costs, actually, the algorithm would take to run if I did this mapping, which is just a bunch of integer logic, which it turns out is really cheap to do, actually parallelizes trivially. I could just try different mappings on different processors. Um, so we do that, and we count, because essentially what we have is a load-balanced algorithm, and we know exactly what's going to happen once we run it. So I have a stack of kernels that's going to run it, and instead of just moving the data around, I call a stack of kernels in a special manner and ask them, okay, how much communication are you going to do if I call you in this way? Um, and so I run that stack for all possible mappings uh, and check which does, which, communication, which does the least amount of communication. So this is essentially kind of auto-tuning at runtime over all the possible decompositions that I might want. Um, so we run that really complicated thing, but that actually is really cheap because it doesn't touch the data. And then finally decide on what mapping we want, and we redistribute to that uh, and run the algorithm. And so how do we actually contract the tensors on a high dimensional processor grid? So now we have something that's decomposed to four dimensions, six dimensions, and there's two ways it can be decomposed. Uh, it could be blocked in that fashion, so we get, have an index that's blocked along this dimension, or it could be replicated. We say replicate the tensor along this dimension. Um, and the combination of those is kind of tuning over these replicating multiplication algorithms that we call 2.5D that I introduced at the start. We're essentially using more memory to lower communication costs, uh, as well as over standard multiplication algorithms that are 2D. Um, and so whenever we have uh, the way the mapping is done is we take a pair of indices that correspond to two tensors. So we'll say two tensors share index i. And we map those two dimensions to different dimensions on the processor grid. And that's what we actually need to later run essentially a multiplication distributed algorithm along those two dimensions. Um, and since now we have a bunch of those mismatched indices. This is how it's, if you, if you were just mapping matrix multiplication, you would map the tensors so that the indices, uh, map a and b for instance, so the index that's contracted over, that's summed over, is mapped to two different dimensions of your 2D processor group. So we do this for a bunch of mismatched indices, a bunch of shared indices, and we mismatch the mapping um, on this processor grid. And then all we do is, okay, so we run the algorithm along these two dimensions, then do a nested call to another algorithm along two other things. Um, and just a bunch of calls like that. Um, literally, it's like, I can write the 2D algorithm for simplification, and instead of calling multiplication for each local subblock, I call another 2D algorithm, um, and so on until I get multiplication um, for each pair of missions. Okay, uh, so that was a bit complicated. I probably lost everybody, but okay. So this is just more of the same. We have replication, so we minimize communication. Um, and so, okay, so what's 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 the downside of all of this? Downside is that we need to redistribute the tensors, as I mentioned earlier. So what changes? The processor grid changes. So I'm using different processor grids based on contraction. The virtualization factor changes along each dimension. Uh, and therefore, the padding changes because it's a good phase series. So I need to iterate over the non-padded part, extract that out, send it to a different tensor, uh, to a different processor, and then put it in the right spot. Uh, and so this is a pretty nasty kernel that uh, took up a lot of the time for writing this whole thing, uh, which is big enough as it is. Uh, but uh, it, what we do is we do, we do something that's pretty fast, and we thread it. We thread all the integer logic, so it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and the communication doesn't turn out to be a bottleneck either. Um, so and I'll show numbers uh, just like that. OK, so uh, that's enough tensor contraction stuff. Now, actually, a little bit of chemistry, not even really. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's physics or math or whichever. 
But okay, so a couple of cluster theory. Okay, so uh, this is actually why we wanted we wanted to do all the stuff in the previous twenty five slides uh, is to run a couple of cluster fast. Um, so okay, we're trying to solve solve the Schrodinger equation uh, with some Hamiltonian, um, and we want to deal with this wave function. We're going to write it as a excitation operator acting on a on a Slater determinant, uh, which is Slater determinant the standard thing you use, um, and this activation operator is uh, essentially uh, exponentiating a bunch of tensors. Uh, and the number of tensors and the dimensions of them is going to kind of give us the level of accuracy that we want. But it's also going to raise the computational cost. So CCSD, the standard method, uses a T1, which is a 2D, uh, 2D tensor, T2, which is a 4D tensor. Um, CCTT has a 6D tensor involved. And CCTQ has an 8D tensor involved. Uh, and the computational cost is accordingly uh, factor of n to the 6, because you have n to the 4 by n to the 4 contractions over two indices, which is the most expensive thing. So this is order n to 6, this is order uh, n 9, and this is order n 12. Uh, and one thing people do is they do some of these t contractions, and they do them in a smart way, and they do this is the parentheses t, uh, which is n to the uh, 7, uh, or rather than uh, n to the 9. Uh, okay, um, so uh, we do a little bit of the formalism of a couple of cluster. Um, so we can break up uh, the Hamiltonian into the one electron and two electron um, interaction portions, um, and we want to deal with those exclusively. And we can essentially have the similarity just from Hamiltonian, um, and I've already done normal ordering here, um, and I'm skipping obviously a ton, uh, but we get this new Hamiltonian, and we essentially want to deal with this thing uh, and this expands in really weird ways uh, according to you know, the good contraction rules um, when we actually deal with this guy. Um, but so what's used now here is the campbell baker hausdorff formula and the Hadamard lemma of that part, uh, which I have no idea where that comes from, uh, but essentially you go from this guy to a bunch of commutators, uh, which is essentially, I guess, already sometimes doing the good contraction. Um, but so now we have these commutators. Okay, so we expand out the commutators, and we finally get something that looks a little bit more sane, uh, which is uh, different terms uh, with t raised to some powers, uh, with I think it's truncated at four, um, and so we just have a bunch of these things for the CCSD, and in CCSD t and q we would have also t three and t four terms. Okay, so we get a lot of terms like that, uh, and we need to now contract them in some sense. So we need to project by phi zero to compute the energy, which just spits out kind of three not very um, terrible terms. Uh, with this is a two electron integral term, and this is a uh, tensor amplitude, um, cluster amplitude. Uh, and so we need to do projections onto uh, these phi i and phi a b i j for to correspondingly compute the amplitude equations to actually solve for t one and t two. Um, and so this spits out a lot more terms, uh, which you can derive in really tedious or automatic ways, or you can build diagrams, and all of a sudden all of this makes a lot more sense somehow, because you can just represent the uh, cluster amplitudes. Uh, if they have four indices, it's like four-legged guys, if they have two indices, it's two-legged guys, and then it turns out that all you need to do is connect them in all possible ways that gives you another four-legged guy, uh, and then you have some symmetry factor. And that's literally how you derive it. Um, and it's kind of fun, actually. I, I, I did CCSD, uh, uh, and it was interesting. So, and in that sense, that's kind of what the weak contraction is doing, is it's connecting them in all possible ways, so contracting over all um, kind of connected pairs of indices, uh, which seems nice because you're supposed to be doing interactions, so you're literally interacting these tensors in some fashion. Um, okay, but so you do all of that, and you, what you get is something that has been recomputed, I don't know how many times, but you get a bunch of uh, diagrams which correspond to a bunch of terms like this, which may involve uh, two or three or four tensors. And so after that, and there, there's a correct answer to this, essentially, for CCD and CCT and CCTQ, um, though it's, you can't actually find it anywhere. You have to do it yourself somehow. Uh, but, okay, you get that, and then you need to do, uh, but you still can't, you don't actually want to compute it in this fashion. You want to put parentheses around these guys. You want to do a factorization uh, and do two tensor contractions. Because tensor contraction, you don't want to do as three tensors when you can do them in pairs. Um, and this is actually really non-trivial. Um, and there's TCE, which does this automatically and tries different things. 
um, and gives you a very good answer. Or you can do it by hand. Uh, my collaborators have done it by hand. And so I, I, I tried to do it by hand. I thought, okay, well, I know how the contraction library works. Maybe I can do it in a way that there's less communication or something. So I wrote out this thing uh, and sent it to Devin and Jeff. Devin responded with their factorization, which looked about four times shorter. Uh, <laughs> so uh, mine was crap. Uh, but so, okay, that I had. Okay, yeah, so I have the actual equations, the factorization later that we use um, that uh, John Stan uh, and Yuri Gauss derived. Um, but I think it's supposed to be a really good one, and it looked like one. Um, there's a lot of tricks you can pull. For instance, you combine T2 with T1 squared, and you make that one tensor, and then you're able to pull a lot of contraction into one. Um, but there is, I, I, I did that trick, but there's like crazy things that you can do to make it even faster and make it pure contractions. But okay, so that factorization gets you some equations that are two tensor equations, and then you can now uh, run. Okay, um, so now actually to talk a little bit about the symmetries of these tensors and what's going on with that. So um, in we have, I'm, I'm going back to this little notation of putting parentheses around symmetric uh, groups because it kind of makes sense to me. Um, so we can the two electron tensor if I write it as V, those other groups like that has uh, these symmetries at least if you're doing spin orbital, um, and it changes once you have the different spin blocks. Um, and T has symmetries like that. Um, though it, again, changes if you're doing spinner integration and, uh, based on that. But generally, we need to support symmetries that look like that. Um, and so what else have here? Right, so spin blocks and spinner grid equation yield something where you have versions of B that correspond to, for instance, uh, if it's in uh, alpha and beta, I guess, uh, then it's not symmetric, but you don't do beta alpha because it's not symmetric. And it's another side. If it's alpha alpha spin, then it is symmetric, and beta beta spin is symmetric. Um, so you, I guess that's how it ends up factorizing. Um, I think it's more complicated than that, but anyway. And so you could also have molecules that are point group symmetries, uh, which you essentially set to give you a lot of blocks, but I think are kind of similar to the spinner integrated stuff in, in the sense that there is just terms you can throw out. Okay, but so how do we actually interface? How many in time, by the way? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't have too much left, but I was curious. Um, so we have an interface both on top of this library um, because obviously nobody wants to actually know or touch anything that's inside this thing, as you can guess based on my talk. Um, so okay, well, what do we actually want to give chemists who want to implement, you know, a couple cluster? Uh, or different flavors of thereof, um, um, we define it this way. So we use Einstein notation and whatever. We have these quotation marks around the indices, but we just write that, uh, and this is a contraction. In fact, this is all permutations of the symmetric contraction necessary um, to compute this thing. So C, A, and B are defined with some symmetries. If they have them, they get partial symmetries, and then we just write this kind of code. Um, so that's kind of a nice abstraction that we have on top. And we also specify spin cases. So if you want to do spin integrated, which is what Devin implemented on top of this thing, he implemented an interface that automatically does all the spins. Basically, at some point, I looked at the code, and I'm just really unhappy because you're doing the same exact thing for all the spin cases, and it's clearly something you can automate, so we automated it. Uh, so what does it uh, replicate the thing when it Oh, right, right. So that means uh, iterate over diagonal. Uh, uh, so this is, I guess, in the CCSD equations, it show up. It shows up elsewhere. In, uh, but, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 useful when down one of this. Um, so it's kind of cumbersome to support as an extra thing, but I did it anyway. Um, but so this essentially says, okay, iterate over the, I guess, hyperdiagonal they call them uh, when it's three indices uh, of the tensor rather than the whole tensor. Um, so if you have like a matrix here. Uh, B and the SAPB, it means just iterator of the diagonal. Um, and that's useful for extracting the diagonals and for doing various stuff with them, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't actually show up in SSD. Okay. Um, so how, how are these defined in the interface? So, okay, we, we, have, we define the spin orbital tensor T2 um, with some indices, and we add spin cases which correspond to these different distributed tensors because we want to treat the spin cases differently. Um, then this says dimension four. Uh, this is the size. This, this means 
um, variational orbitals or occupied orbitals. This is the symmetries. A means asymmetric, M means not symmetric. Uh, and uh, yeah, just more indices. So you really just to see different cases, blocks of different Our implementation though, so that you can do it. If you do the spin orbital, you can just do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're doing more work, I guess, than the, the spin integrated equation. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But so there are different ways to implement right. integration. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really expert on that, but this is what we have. Um, okay. So yeah. So what what is RCCSD? It's UHF. It's spin integrated. We don't use disk in any of this uh, as of yet. Um, and we don't. So what do you mean by spin integrated? Maybe it is wrong. Uh, I think it's UHF. So uh, is, is 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 the spin integrated only show up in RHF? Oh, you mean, well, you have the other time is to the public book and half and get are different, so then we don't have spin symmetry of that sort. The alpha, alpha, alpha is equal to beta, 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 beta. beta. No, it's alpha, beta is equal to beta, alpha, right? Well, there are also both alpha, 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 and beta, 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 beta. So okay. these two are similar. So overall, we reduce cost the storage of data in the district by Okay. So. I thought I'm pretty sure we're doing UHF, but I could be okay, sorry. Maybe I don't know. So the the right? Yeah, I mean so these four T two, these are the three cases. Okay. So I have, not, so that's okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm not okay, great. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we don't we have kind of uh so Devin on the side wrote also SCF codes, integral codes, uh, and we have some basic I.O., but these are not mature components. Mm -hmm. And when we when I'm going to be showing benchmark numbers, I'm only showing the contractions. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not, we're not, and the, what I'm showing is contractions for like random numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all at the same time do verification for like a very small molecule mm -hmm. and make sure that CCC is doing their competing the right thing. But we're only timing the contractions for now, and we don't have a full-blown CCSD library that you can use immediately. What we have is a tensor contraction library that you can implement on top of. Um, but and eventually, I think uh, we, we, these should be done pretty soon. Um, so we have basic limitations of them. Like, yeah. So we don't have this time um, because we have iteration because we have something we report. Oh, we have time for CCSD. Yes, we're looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, CCSD without us, yeah. Right, that's fine. Right, right. But it's all the dust contractions, mm -hmm. and they're correct. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, SCF shouldn't be a big factor at all. If we do it at all properly, uh, right? Okay. So here's our actual derivation. Which probably should have come earlier. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of terms, um, but they're all yeah, basically what you expect. Uh, I'm sure you guys have your own and probably don't care about this one. Uh, but uh, you can cut this off somewhere here. But this is roughly how it looks like, and it's in the paper, so you can find it there. Um, I don't know if there's anything particularly interesting to say about this. So I guess one thing I've got to mention is that we do, in this case, have symmetries that are preserved and symmetries that are broken. Um, for instance, if this guy was symmetric, it's broken to make those, and this is symmetric. Uh, but yeah, both of these cases occur, they both need to be dealt with. Um, okay. So here's the actual implementation. Uh, and I want to squeeze this all on one slide because it fits in one slide, because we can do it. So this is, this is actually using the interface, the actual code that we run. Um, and all I did was remove a bunch of profiling calls. This is this would compute the right to see. So in some sense, the interface is compact. Um, I, I would call this compact just for how much is actually going on. Because each one of these is doing all of the contractions for all the spin blocks um, and doing all the permutations or the symmetric permutations. Our original code had, kind of had this un unfolded um, when we only had essentially the packed portion of the symmetric contraction as the interface. But now it's much more compact. And, uh, Everything basically corresponds to diagrams now, I think. Um, so it's nice. Uh, okay, so this is the implementation. Um, and so sequential performance. I'm going to lowball the performance at first because our sequential performance isn't good. Um, and another warning about these numbers is that I think they were gotten late last week uh, and not by me and not without programming. So I'm not fully confident in them. Uh, but they're nevertheless, uh, I found them interesting. Um, so it's a bunch of systems. Here's the number of electrons, number of orbitals, um, and we compare with MRCC with NLB Tam of the C4. And this is running just sequentially on some Intel processor, um, so it's not even doing any distributions. Uh, all CTF is really doing is a non-symmetric transpose uh, and uh, doing an equivalent channel. 
Um, and I guess the non-symmetric transpose in the way that we implement it actually turns out to be a bottleneck uh, when the number of electrons is small because it's... So that's persistence due direction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess we're faster than MRCC. We're slower than the Well, MRCC, that's a different equation. I have no idea what MRCC yeah. does. Uh, that no, would be too crazy, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. But so, yeah, uh, but so we approach them when this gets closer to kind of square, uh, when the number of electrons goes up. But at the same time, okay, this is five seconds per iteration, 25 seconds per iteration is a scale that it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, so I don't know if these numbers actually matter. Uh, but okay, so let's actually go in parallel and do what I, 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 I haven't. I put no time in optimizing push performance other than getting it kind of decent enough and getting threading properly. And this is not a meeting threading. Mm -hmm. Okay, so parallel performance. So on 64 nodes of a pre XC6 and doing much larger systems now. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, I think, more interesting computations. Um, CTF is much faster in WCAM. Uh, and so. 64 nodes. Each node is. Uh, each node is 12 cores. Uh, no, 24 right? Yeah, four processes, six rest of the process. 24 cores. So number of cores is 24 times 64. Mm -hmm. So, for essentially we're faster and faster for a larger system. So in this case, in WKIM didn't complete an iteration within like the half an hour that I gave it, which I think something was going wrong. This is a TCE version that I think uses a little more memory or something. So maybe it's running out of memory. But so the W9 of this bigger system that didn't complete on 64 nodes completed in 128 nodes for a WKIM in 223 seconds. Uh, we did it in 73 seconds. Um, yeah, so, so we have numbers for this sort of problems, so that would be interesting to compare. And it's, uh, yeah, okay, that's very interesting. Okay, and then these are pretty new numbers too, actually. So we, we got paper accepted, and we're just doing the, the final version of the deal next week. Mm -hmm. So we've been collecting new numbers, mm -hmm. and we've gotten much better numbers that are reported in the report currently. <laughs> um, but so the, we're in parallel, we're essentially faster in WCAM. And there's so not much else. For iteration, right? Yeah, iteration. Per iteration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, and so now, to the big plot, what I uh, care, care about is doing a really large calculation. Um, and I think this might be the largest calculation anybody's ever done, at least without using point group symmetry. And this is a thousand, uh, two hundred fifty orbitals, two hundred fifty electrons. And this is running in really large scale in BGQ. So it's five twelve nodes to eight thousand nodes. Um, but in 512 nodes, there's uh, so there's kind of 16 cores on BGQ per node, and there's 64 threads that you use, so each core has four CPUs. Um, so the level of parallel here is 8,000 times 64. Mm -hmm. um, and we use, we've been, most of these runs are done with four processes per node and 16 threads per process. So that might need to change the scale further. Um, but so we hit half a bottle plot um, for that calculation. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, and so I have profiling numbers for calculation done to get this number mm -hmm. uh, a little bit from now. So, okay, first I want to show the percentage of clops. So we just plugged in HPM, which is an automatic clop counter on Bujin Q, um, and compared that to the peak efficiency that the machine could get. And we're actually improving in efficiency, basically because as you can fit a larger system, it takes longer. So actually more time is spent in doing multiplication rather than the other costs. Uh, but general also means that we don't have bottlenecks that are killing us as we scale, uh, which most folks do. Um, so we have, uh, we, we go to something like a third of the efficiency, a third of peak, um, which, so there's room for improvement. Um, there's other things that are overheads, uh, but it's a decent fraction of peak. And this is not just like amplification. So even the amplification kernel we're using is getting like 50 to 60% of peak uh, when we're calling it. So a big part of the loss is based on that. So we're something like half of each um, based on the time that's being spent on. Um, okay, so, right, so now actual breakdowns for what's going on. So on 4,000 nodes of uh, Mira, which is a Bluetooth key machine, for 1,000 orbitals, 200 electrons, uh, as a four process, no 16 times per process, the, each iteration is 18 minutes. Um, so the iterations are getting more expensive here. Uh, so the, most of the time is spent in machine notification. Um, and so this is, I'm just giving the complexity of it. Um, So there, there's there's a lot of other stuff going on, um, but I mean it, uh, at a lower scale we're actually spending less time in DJM, like thirty percent. Um, 
Um, so this actually goes well. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to get anything to really to, to spend all this time in teaching with the scale, especially when you have 64 threads that are flying to the board. Yeah. So 20% um, of it is being spent in broadcasts, which are in this kind of nested SUMI algorithms. It's actually necessary for your simplification, and it's something we try to lower. And in fact, this is with the apology we're mapping, which really helps this number because BGQ actually has optimized apology we broadcasts if you do the mapping correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so th this is a number that actually would be higher on other machines. Um, so now all of these guys are redistribution. So there's a, and so the kind of surprising one here was this, and this is, this is kind of bad, um, and it's, it's kind of silly though too. So what is prefix sum? Uh, prefix sum is necessary uh, when you're doing a redistribution and when you figure it out, okay, you want, you want to figure out where everything goes. So mm -hmm. you want to send to each process, you want to tell them, okay, I'm sending you this much data. And you want to kind of do a prefix on that um, to figure out what all the offsets are. Mm -hmm. And so this is something like old number of processors times the virtualization factor um, is what the buffer size is kind of. And so all this is an all reduction and some computation on it. But it scales not as number of elements, but as number of processors. And we're using, uh, at, at this point, 4,000 to so 16,000 16, processors and maybe a factor of 16 virtualization at most. Mm -hmm. So this is getting to 100,000 to a million. And so the, even for small contractions, this is scaling up. But okay, I, I think this can be fixed with some workarounds. Um, it's not, so this is not at all a bottleneck like on smaller runs. Uh, it's, it's tiny in smaller runs. But so this data packing in this Alto, so this Alto LV is what we thought might be a scaling bottleneck like as we scale. But at least in BGQ, the bisection bandwidth is pretty high and it's just one Alto LV per contraction. So even if you do the math of that, it's theoretic. It's a, a redistribution transpose. Uh, B means that uh, all to all means just everybody communicates with everybody, uh -huh. and B means a different amount. Uh, so it's not a not everybody doesn't send everybody the same amount, but a different amount, mm -hmm. which algorithmically is actually a lot harder to uh, do. Um, so it matters. Mm -hmm. um, and so this data packing is the sequential redistribution work that th so th th this guy can be a bigger bottleneck at smaller scale, um, but in parallel. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something, but this, so this relatively speaking goes down as you scale up. But this is something that's maybe on the order of the cost. So maybe all together their distribution can be on the order of the cost of change. So that's maybe about 50% of our time. Um, and this tensor folding is forms. So I was seeing when I was just trying out some of the sequential runs that uh, Devin did and reported those numbers, that the tensor folding for these really square matrices, uh, square tensors with, where, where the number of orbitals uh, the number of occupied orbitals is really small. This was occupying a decent fraction of the time. And I was really surprised by that. But actually, but that's kind of special performance, although I should test if it actually matters at a lower scale. And there's maybe optimizations we can do there, because I, I, I was under the impression that the non symmetric transpose is going to be very cheap. And it turns out it actually has support. Um, so that's uh, an area we can probably improve too. Um, OK, and so I also did uh, the same performance comparison on Hopper, um, except for a different run, because it's it's a smaller scale. So this, this run took nine minutes, so the 56 nodes, uh, back on our orbitals, 100 electrons. Uh, and so this is how we run a hopper. Um, but so here I'm kind of just showing the relative change between here and here. So, and the trouble is that the DGEM time, the mixed multiplication time has gone on, down by 24%. So now we're only spending a fifth of the time on a different machine in gem. And this is because it was essentially the topology we were mapping that we get on BGQ. Um, like the, this code is designed to run particularly fast in BGQ, but you know, com in comparison to NWCAM, for instance, we're still a lot faster um, when running with this type of efficiency. <laughs> so yeah, it's about a fifth of that. These broadcasts have gone up a lot. I mean, it's two to six nodes, so it's at a pretty large scale. And on Hopper, the nodes are just kind of all over the place. They're not a nice topology. So it's because of that, the broadcasts are not very efficient there. Um, and we've seen this as a bottom like and also just only your algebra kernels. Mm -hmm. They're also spending their time with communication, even they're a lot simpler than this. Uh, now, do you have something for like more standard, like the smaller scale plus? Right. Well, I was trying to go with some numbers on Carver, but we had issues with both the NW, most of the NW cam uh, running it there. But I, I want to get that comparison. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, probably won't make it into this paper, but in the future we want to do that. Yeah. Because I know, I know that matters a lot yeah. for systems. A lot of people use, mm -hmm. uh, but so I think Hopper is not far from that. Um, uh, Hopper has a uh, which is a great six system, mm -hmm. so it's it's not an infinite band. It's a more BG network, mm -hmm. but it's not 
that much better than any bad idea. Um, so I think it's still it's just still a relevant comparison. And there's there's no topology aware stuff here. This is running in the same mode as it would on an infinite bed cluster. Um, so I think the numbers you're seeing here would be a I'm guessing about this one in the bed cluster, but I, 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 I don't know what the test for it. Um, right. Okay, so yeah, like that's most of that. So hierarchical cluster is what we want to take this. So we've done CCSDT and CCDT we have we're debugging in the house actually. Mm -hmm. um, so the next paper we'll write will probably have CCDT at least numbers and maybe CCDTQ. I think that one der derivation for that. I mean, we want to implement that. Though of course the worry is how are these things are going to scale. So okay, I, 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 I can use uh, you know, a million processors, but even for CCDTQ, I still have to take the log base eight or whatever to get the number how much larger the system is going to be. And then I get like a factor of four. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> because these methods just don't scale. Um, and so we at some point we want to also do CCT parentheses T, but we're not prioritizing it because it's going to require some modifications to kind of do these uh, slices of the tensors. Um, and these are low order because essentially we're we implementing everything, so there's no assumptions in the dimension. So we don't have to rewrite our code to make it 60 or something. We just need to fix it up so it works for 60. Um, so we want to get these working. Um, so uh, okay. Uh, so sparsity is something that I'm very interested in. I don't know how well it would fit in with the framework that we've designed, um, but I know there's uh, some groups I've spoken to, I believe, um, who, so they're, I know they're working on some framework that's supposed to exploit sparsity, and the type of thing that they're considering actually sounds up, up kind of good is when you use a subset of the virtual orbitals um, for associated with every occupied orbital. Um, and so that means that you should get scaling that's order n, uh, or not n, but the, the linear scale, um, which is which would be, which would be great. But it's not clear how that exactly is going to work, and it's not clear how, at least I haven't seen equations that propagate this through the amplitudes and have everything be sparse and have the intermediates be sparse. And I'd love to see that. I'd love to see, because this would be a really interesting implementation kind of uh, project and stuff. So. Um, yeah, and so there's other ways that, um, are kind of orthogonal, mm -hmm. but that's one that I think our code can maybe be modified. I wouldn't say it's uncommon. You can show some results that we can. Use. No, not not, not so that, I but the lower ranking. The lower so. ranking no, no, I would say that it's actually quite. But it seems they usually give up the symmetries no, and they no, go to no, matrices. No, not at all. No, not okay. At all. But, yeah. So it depends. Uh, different right. Right. Yeah. So what I've right. seen has been yeah. kind of like reducing our matrices. Yeah. yeah. So in principle, some of them would work just fine. Okay. Right, especially if you just for the um, for the integrals, if you're compressing those, um, save memory, um, the, that kind of stuff. Well, goes I mean, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Dima told me about that this morning. Um, yeah, so that that's not part. Yeah. Okay. Um, so and, and also a question that is maybe completely relevant. Uh, but so in the process of working on this stuff, and I also work obviously on other linear algebra operations other than just you know, multiplication and contraction. Um, there's a lot of other linear algebra out there. Uh, and the actual question it asks seems to be, okay, well, so you have these symmetric tensors with some structure, and now we're calling, uh, you know, we're reducing them to matrices uh, and calling the early multiplication on that, getting the contraction that way. So is there an application for reducing symmetric tensors to matrices and calling a different operation, like a solve or an eigen solve? Essentially, you know, can I, can I solve for x in this equation? Where there's symmetries well, like that's that. that's how we solve complex cluster equations, and then response equations for amplitude, so equations are similar, only that they have potentials. And uh, in our code, we use uh, our solvers that take abstract data types that we are written as templates. So you can pass symmetric matrices, you can pass whatever you want. So, but that's very common sort of thing that is needed in the scientific applications on application like that. So if you can write it in abstract form and if your data can be represented in symmetric markets, you plug it in and you benefit right. from all the infrastructure we have in the right. so But it's actually, I guess, we know how to do symmetric features in linear algebra, but, uh, but I haven't seen anybody do anything with is, okay, so what if I want to factorize a matrix that has higher dimensional symmetric structure. So, uh, you know, when I'm doing uh, matrix multiplication on T T3, which has 3D symmetric group indices, I'm mapping that to a matrix. And that has structures and multiple broken symmetries, which uh, I can't, it's not just a symmetric matrix, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a different beast. 
Uh, and so this would be, I think, a question for the current algorithms that we have for all of this okay. stuff. Okay, so that's probably a solution topic on how we tackle this without. Yeah, I'm curious if you guys have a question. very general approach, and there might be something actually that could be beneficial. Uh, because, yes, it's very important. Um, right. It just sounds like an interesting problem to me. Yes, and yes. I didn't know anybody <laughs> didn't hit it all the time. <laughs> but no, I, like I have a question how, you know, what are dependencies of your code? So do you use any of these infrastructure code? Uh, and how do you care? I lost. It's a little Uh Well, from scratch, so in principle, let's say, if uh, uh, you know, someone wants to use it for another type of cluster application, so there would be the necessary interface would be only to provide to the initial data, integrals, and some information. Right. There, that's kind of a couple of different uh, ways to plug into those things. And we haven't really figured out how to interface properly. We don't really have users yet. Um, though I guess I can think of definitely users in some sense, and part of that is the question. Because the definite is designing this higher level interface stuff and SCF integrals, all of that. Um, and for, for instance, Evgeny uh, wants to, I think, plug in to the test attraction library and they have their own interface and their own real codes. So what we'll probably do is separate just the contraction library, maybe with this interface on top of it, Mm -hmm. um, from the rest of the chemistry package mm -hmm. that kind of Devon is developing on his side and package all of that separately. But yeah, it's the, I mean, the, the, the code that I've been basically essentially talking about this whole time, except for, you know, the little bit about the interface, is all stuff I wrote, uses GLAS uh, for mixed mm -hmm. duplication and MPI for duplication, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very few dependencies, and it's opening license, it's in my name. So it's, it's easy to plug into it again. Um, yeah, one of these, you know, uh, projects we discussed, we uh, were discussing with the rest of the people within this uh, cyber institute are developing in this direction and you need to really would be great to have some sort of a very modular structure for tensor libraries such that there could be multiple implementations of some one movie we are very independent. We have to combine an interface and take different pieces of different one thing I've done, I think, is, 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 is very much to that direction and further is that we can actually take still, you know, a different sequential interaction kernel and plug it into our code. Yes, uh, yes, so yes, less yes, trivial yes, now. So yes, this, yes. this is not very modular. But it, I mean, it's still kind of, there's this assumption built into this and the sequential, so I think when, when Devin was thinking about what the sequential kernel should be, um, it was kind of, it was weird to him because what the, kind of the parallel abstraction that we've made make it different. Um, what you have locally is not something that you can transpose and get. So what you have is not really symmetric. It's just packed. Um, so your subtensor isn't a symmetric subtensor. It's, just, it's, a, it's a packed subtensor. And even if you had an asymmetric tensor originally, the diagonal could be built. Um, so it's, it's it's a little bit of a break in that abstraction. So just if you, if a kernel actually tries to do some more advanced things like he was trying to do sequentially, um, that might not just hold in a kind of parallel environment. That Okay, and I think it's the conclusion slides that just summarize with everything. Um, yeah, so communication matters, and that's what we kind of uh, started with. Um, and plus reaction multiplications, but except for the symmetries. Um, and so there we have CTO, which is our solution to that. Okay. Thank you.